U.S.-China relations. Obviously, when you talk about the U.S. and China for businesses, it's going to be a new paradigm in which everyone operates. It's going to be a certain degree of instability, lack of you know, clarity sometimes. But if we set aside the sort of vagaries of their domestic politics, set aside U.S. domestic, domestic politics, the challenges that China may be going through, you've seen this for many years already. How do you foresee a long-term sort of stable situation between the U.S. and China that at least the business sector, governments, or even the people can start preparing for? What's, what's the likelihood? The so two economies are so intertwined, and I think um, we all have to work uh, to, to create uh, situations where um, the tensions do not span out of control. But if I come to the fundamental issue, it's not so much the question which country has the larger economy. I think the question is who masters the fourth industry revolution? Because it is industrial superiority, innovative superiority. Uh, just think of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and so on, which actually provides power to a country. So what we will see is a race for um, leadership in the fourth industrial revolution. And you see also other countries forming their own sort of uh, separate alliances, allegiances, clubs amongst themselves and even within in Geneva you have plurilateral sort of groupings everyone sort of forming their own uh, little circles of influence do you see this as something positive uh, as a sort of a development in, in global geopolitics it's really multipolar because you have the middle states like Saudi Arabia Indonesia um, and of course uh, India um, uh, exercising great influence on global um, on, uh, on on the global situation. Saudi Arabia, thanks to its um, energy reserves, India, thanks to the fact that it is the fastest growing economy at the moment. Then you have, uh, I would say, also the industry industrial powers. You could, you could argue today that some of the companies like Google, Microsoft and so on are truly uh, multinational power factors. So it's a very complex world. And it's not a very stable world because we are now witnesses, witnessing a kind of dynamic system which is constantly changing. And I should also add, by the way, to the power factors, small countries. Yeah. I would argue that um, in the world of tomorrow, it's not the, it's the big fish eating the small fish, but the fast fish eating the slow fish. And so you have countries like Singapore, like um, I would add Switzerland or uh, Israel playing also a a, a essential role in the global system. We have to confront a very um, fra uh, fragmented and I would say to a certain extent turbulent system because those countries compete not only in economic terms, they compete having different values, having different systems. So the world uh, is relatively full of complexities and certainly also uncertainties. Now what we have to do in order um, to stick together is to look at those issues where we have really global interdependence, where um, if we do not cooperate we will have a lose-lose situation. I'm thinking for example um, at the environmental uh, challenge which we have, I think at um, migration challenges and so on and so on. And we should focus our efforts of collaborations on those touch points. What's your advice to the young Singaporeans, the young Qataris, the young Swiss who see this fast fish phenomenon? Uh, is there something of a mindset shift that they need to have to be able to compete, uh, to be able to eat the slow fish? Yes, I think to embrace change. Uh, what we see now, um, 
uh, and we will come back to it, uh, uh, this complex world and also now the new factor of uh, the technological revolution, particularly uh, artificial intelligence, people have difficult to understand. And um, what we see is a certain fear of the future. I think it's the first time in global history that people are so pessimistic about the future. Now, my advice would be embrace change. Change will be a constant factor of our lives. And those people who see change as an opportunity and not as a threat will succeed. But there are some people who also fear or think of this as a sort of a fundamental transition point in human history, this move into AI. Do you see any prospect of larger global cooperation, setting, a, setting sort of guide, guidelines, guardrails? I feel that artificial intelligence is not only a game changer for uh, business, it could be a game changer for societies. And we have to uh, make all the efforts to use the tremendous opportunities offered by artificial intelligence. But there are social and, as I mentioned, existential challenges. The social challenges are, uh, for example, in the capability to influence elections in a much stronger way and public opinion in general uh, compared to what we have seen in the past, which is a danger for democracy. Uh, we have the impact on um, the workforce. A study which the World Economic Forum did shows that about one quarter of jobs will disappear or replaced by artificial intelligence and one other quarter will require reskilling and upskilling. And then you have the existential question because first you, you have um, the shift of power from governments to business and you have uh, the question that the whole system may go out of the control. So what the World Economic Forum has done, we created a artificial intelligence uh, governance alliance. We have in the alliance, uh, we have cooperating all the big companies, Google, Microsoft, Meta, IBM, and so on. And on the other hand, we have um, integrated into those efforts also the G7 effort under the um, leadership of uh, Japan. We work together with US, we work together with the European Union, and we will have in November a um, artificial intelligence. It will, our second, will be our second uh, meeting with all the experts in, on our campus in uh, San Francisco as a preparation for the next annual meeting in Davos, which we will make a true global summit to look at all the aspects of artificial intelligence and also to develop, uh, based on proposals, um, the necessary um, safeguards which we need um, and which require global collaboration. We cannot have different safeguards in different, um, let's say, global regions. Are you confident that the co collaboration between businesses and between business and government is something that can sort of progress as uh, rapidly as needed because the technology is developing extremely rapidly? And But just initial sense, do you think there's room for uh, optimism? No, you need a kind of um, uh, resetting of government-business relations because in the traditional way um, governments looked at a um, new technology and set the necessary rules um, for the further development of the technology. But here the technology is moving so fast 
And it's also very difficult to understand really the technology. So the danger is governments will be too late in creating the necessary um, uh, borderlines around the technology and business, which is in a competitive battle, will just move ahead. And that means the ghost will mm -hmm. leave the bottle. So we have here to, to put much more emphasis on self-regulation, and that's what the World Economic Forum is doing, to make sure that this self-regulation is also, maybe sometimes afterwards, approved and endorsed by governments and civil society. We are, everyone knows, soon to be a super-aged society. Many societies in, in Asia as well, Japan and Korea, are moving in that direction. What's your sense in how do we change the narrative from talking about longevity and an aged society, age society, from sort of a, a slightly negative challenge kind of narrative into something potentially positive? We should not just speak about uh, longevity, longevity but we should speak about healthy old age. And um, this starts, in my opinion, at uh, an early age. We should even introduce um, in schools uh, the teaching, I would say, of health literacy. Uh, because definitively, we have today in many parts of the world and in many sectors of population, uh, we have unhealthy behavior, which afterwards have a big impact not only on uh, health insurances, but also on the quality of life. Our effort should be not only to prolong life, but to make sure that we have as long as possible a healthy life. And this starts with uh, health literacy, to know what are actually the factors which make your life um, healthier. Um, a second element is the question of retirement. Uh, we, we created this uh, retirement age principle uh, when people have much, had much shorter uh, life expectancies. I think we should be very flexible uh, related to the integration of older people into the work process. And finally, um, uh, I think it's, it's a question also, um, what is the meaning of life? What, what mission uh, do people have when they get older? Do they feel idle or do they still have a mission? I would say my, my own um, most important resource um, for being active um, is this notion of having a mission in life. Thank you, Professor Schwab. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.